Ladies and gentlemen, you're about to experience the Gut Check Project, talking science, health, and innovation that you can actually use. But this isn't just another health show. We're here to have fun and make your time enjoyable. Well, while you are enjoying yourself, know that even though the GCP covers some health topics with healthcare pros, we are not your doctors. So use our show to entertain your mind and not for medical advice. And now, here are your hosts of the Gut Check Project, Dr. Ken Brown and Eric Rieger. Hello, Gut Check Project fans and KBMD Health family. I am your host, Eric Rieger. This is episode number 76, and I'm joined by a better man, Dr. Kenneth Brown. What's up, Ken? What's going on? Nothing. Uh, episode 76, we're going to call this the fasting episode because we're going to talk a little bit about fasting. But before we get into that, what's been going on in the Rieger household? Uh, I mean, really, it's just kind of low key. Not a whole lot going on. Uh, why? You sure? I kind of uh, feel like you're not oh, telling oh, me something. Yes, Mac uh, has been striping parking lots, and he um, he is making some real money going out there being an independent contractor at the age of 18. So, yeah, I'm very proud of him. Very proud of Mac as well. Nothing else has happened in your life? Ooh. Uh, I mean, things are going well for Gage. Uh, he's still, oh, he's refing. I forgot that. You're, you're right. Gage may be on track to become a collegiate basketball ref. Uh, this will be his second full year of officiating. And um, now he's out in the West Texas chapter of basketball officiating. It looks like he'll be calling nothing but varsity games this next year, putting him on track for Collegiate officiating. Okay, so I'm I'm super. I one of my biggest concerns has may have taken place. So if you're watching this on YouTube, um, Eric is in a ginormous shoulder brace, and, oh. I, and it. Yeah, I was worried because you recently had surgery, and I'm now concerned that your blood pressure dropped so much that you have short term memory loss because you had rotator cuff surgery, a major surgery, a big surgery. Uh, yeah, it was. They they say like, it's big. The day before yesterday, like where most people are still heavily dosed on pain medicine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is a baller podcaster. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> this guy showed up to do a podcast essentially a day and a half after having major rotator cuff surgery, which is one of the most painful surgeries you can do. I worked as a physical therapy tech for a long time, and I did not want to tell him how painful it was going to be afterwards. And he showed up to do a podcast. You're a complete beast. Holy cow. This show is important to me. And so I decided to go ahead and make it happen. You're an animal. This is awesome. It's not as bad, though, as, as even I imagined. And I will say, uh, the person who performed the procedure has been a guest on our show, uh, Dr. Wade McKenna. Um, I've performed anesthesia for him as he's done these before, knees, hips, etc. But <clears throat> shoulders, I like the way that he works. And in addition to doing a traditional arthroscopy on my right shoulder, he also uh, extracted uh, anterior iliac crest, uh, stem cells, spun them down and injected the side as well. Just like he had done for my, my left elbow. All right. So I obviously love my co-host Eric and we've worked together and he's super tough. I had no idea how tough he was because as it turns out, he's been walking around with a torn rotator cuff muscle called the infraspinatus and where most people, supra, supra spinatus, um, where most people can't function and you've been doing your job and working out and doing this for a long time. Yeah. Apparently that was the wrong thing to do. It just, it just made it worse. Uh, so uh, Wade got in there and he basically told me that, uh, yeah, you've, you've been dealing with this for a while and I don't know why you waited so long to come in and see me. And, uh, so I wish I had gone earlier and maybe we wouldn't have had to have done this. Well, but it, it's okay. you Tolerated the surgery well. Definitely. You're here. Yeah, I am. Yeah, and I I know you can't work right now, so as an anesthesiologist, and so I think it's impressive that you sold all your pain medicines to uh, to make up for not working. No, he did not do that. I'm just kidding. Okay. Uh, that did not happen. Uh, now, I, I, I do have some uh, hydrocodone with acetaminophen uh, mixed. I have... Honestly, I just have not come close to consuming anywhere near what they said the recommended dose would be. And today I haven't taken anything. Um, so, I mean, it's achy, it's sore. I wouldn't say that the pain is huge. And um, and uh, Wade is 
probably aggressive with others when he doesn't have to, when he when he judges that the surgery isn't too serious. Um, I could go ahead and take the immobilizer off and do like the arm dangles, making the making the O's and the X's. So I've been doing that, and um, and it's it's tight. I can tell that there's going to be, you know, there's a road to hoe, but uh, we're going to get through it. Wow. Well, well, once again, thank you so much for showing up to do this podcast a day and a half after having a super major surgery, which traditionally is supposed to be a really tough recovery. So thanks for plugging in this little ice machine over here that keeps my arm nice. Yeah. In fact, if you're just listening to this on Spotify or on iTunes, take, take the time here to at least just look at YouTube real quick. Cause this guy's got this massive arm brace on that's hooked up to a cooler that pumps cold water into his shoulder to try and decrease the inflammation. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't give me any intelligence, but it definitely keeps the shoulder nice and cool. <laughs> I'm not going to complain ever, ever, <laughs> ever again about any pain or anything. So That's all right. Yeah, I'm going to end up, you're, you're, you're going to be like, listen, you need to go home. You're coughing all over me. I'm like, I love this spot. <laughs> <laughs> Just covid all over you. Yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, hey, yo, it, it is what it is. I felt like that if I could be mobile, I, I'm just not one that wants to be held down. I like to be able to do things. And I get joy of not being able, or I'm not being able, of, of not being pinned down. I mean, I like to, this is cathartic for me. Even though it's a little bit painful, I want to, to do stuff. I don't like missing out on my my activities. So. The, the most painful thing that I've had happen to me today is the fact that you had to cut a slit in an Atron Teal t-shirt, which is highly valuable now because yeah. a lot of people love those, uh, to put that on. But it, 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 it looks good on you. It's working. <laughs> oh, no collared shirt today. Sorry, Stephen. So it wasn't going to quite work out. All right, well, let's jump into the episode. This is the fasting episode. Uh, I feel a little bit insensitive to jumping into a topic when you just went through this, but no, you know. let's do it. We got, right. we got stuff to cover. All right, so last episode, what we covered was a lot of the future that's going on, but a lot of the stuff I talked about actually could be very expensive. Cellular regeneration, we talked about exosomes, we talked about wearables, we talked about stem cells, all that stuff. And the, the point of that is to show where, how much science is headed that way. But what we're going to talk about today is a science-backed, free way to improve your lifespan, health span, and longevity. And that's fasting. And it sounds like it's not going to be very fun or sciencey, but there's tons of fun and science in fasting. Definitely. And so we're going to cover that. Hopefully, um, it, it gets a little bit sciencey, and that's where you're going to come in and make sure I don't go down too many rabbit holes. But... Uh, <laughs> This is uh, something that you really need to pay attention to because it's easy, it's free, and you are in total control of this. So, fasting, the fasting episode, episode 76. Let's do it. All right, let's just jump right in to, let's just look at, at uh, population groups. Let's talk about the blue zones. The blue zones are the five different zones that have been studied that looked at how people live much longer. You know, that's like Okinawa, Japan, Loma Linda, Sardinia, Italy, Nicoya, Costa Rica, and Icaria, Greece are the five that they looked at. Consistently across them, there's different things that go on, like social gatherings and stuff like that, but they all practice some form of caloric restriction. Mm -hmm. So what they've shown is, is that in both animals and humans, caloric restriction leads to a longer life. Something that I did find a little funny is preparing for this. There are now known as unblue zones. Oh. Yeah. The Southern United States is yeah. being called an unblue zone. Yeah, I'm sure. The exact opposite of blue zone. So uh, when people talk about fasting, you, you can start looking at this and there's all different like, you know, time fasting, there's the five day fast, there's water fast, there's all this stuff. If you just look at the physiology of it, let's just break it down by hours okay. on fasting. Okay, so there's actually four stages to fasting. In the first stage, four hours after you eat, insulin jumps up and what it's doing is it's drawing the glucose from the food that you ate. After you draw the food to do whatever your body needs, the body goes, okay, here's some excess fuel we're going to turn it into glycogen. And mm -hmm. then the glycogen gets stored in both primarily muscles and liver. And then once the glycogen stores are full, if you continue to eat, any excess calories will be turned into fat. So that happens just a few hours after you eat. Then the if you think about it like this, when I was trying to think about the glycogen, glycogen and glucose is like the stuff you put in your refrigerator. Mm -hmm. Fat is the stuff you put in the freezer. 
Okay. So if you got one of those deep freezers, you can always reach in there and pull from that. But if you're always keeping your refrigerator full, you're never touching that freezer. That's a good analogy. Okay. Yeah, just, just kind of think of it that way. Now, stage two is between four hours and 16 hours after eating. And when that happens, food is no longer your primary source of energy. That's when your body turns around and looks at the glycogen. And what it does is it takes the glycogen from the liver and muscles and it does something called glycogenolysis. In other words, breaking down of the glycogen and turning it back in to glucose. And so the breakdown of the glycogen actually turns it into glucose, and this is going to last for approximately 24 hours if you don't eat. If you exercise, you can speed that process up. Okay. Because if you're fasting and you work out, your muscles need the fuel, and if you have no glucose, then it's just going to convert the glycogen. Think about that, because when you have full glycogen and you keep eating, then it puts stuff in the freezer, mm. the fat. Now, stage three is between 16 to 36 hours after eating. That's when your body goes, okay, we're not eating, mm -hmm. and I'm going to start learning to use both fat and protein as fuel. So what it can do is it can take actually the protein that's in your body floating around amino acids and through a process called gluconeogenesis, it forms glucose. And then the fat starts to break down and that forms ketones. Your body can make glucose from uh, protein, gluconeogenesis, but it can also start utilizing the fat as fuel. So when stage three takes place, which is between 30 hours to 24 days after eating, the body learns and becomes very efficient. It's already spent all the glycogen. It really doesn't want to keep breaking down muscle right. to form gluconeogenesis. So it goes, oh, let's open the freezer up mm -hmm. and let's take some of this fat out. By this point, most of the tissues have learned to use the ketones as fuel. That is the ketogenic diet, that is ketosis. Mm -hmm. And so fasting can vary by time. So when we talk about fasting, although this is a fasting episode, we're really gonna focus on one thing, the most common form of fasting, because intermittent fasting is probably the most common one. So we're gonna get into that. The other forms of fasting, you're probably going, why would I go 24 days without eating? Well, you're probably not. Right. Very, very, very few people will do that, but your body is adapted to actually do that, believe it or not. So the benefits of fasting slash caloric restriction include decrease in body fat, increased sensitivity to insulin, which means you're gonna protect yourself from diabetes, mm -hmm. decreased chronic inflammation, and most importantly, increasing autophagy. Can you explain what autophagy is? Autophagy is usually, so with the, the phagy in the word means that uh, the cells that need to be taken out are eliminated. <clears throat> usually problematic cells, which could have uh, poor code, right? If they've been replicated or something like that, autophagy is basically the cleaning mechanism to make certain that we're not allowing cells that don't belong to proliferate. Exactly. So, we actually age because of inflammation. So much so that there's a term that's called inflammaging that scientists are now using. They're saying that we age because of that. In other words, if we could stop the inflammation, we can stop the inflammaging, which can stop aging altogether. Because like you said, cells will divide and turn over and because of poor code, they can create oxygen radicals and then DNA damage takes place. And that's how we that's how cells age and get damaged over time. Mm -hmm. And it's almost exclusively due to inflammation. So this inflammation happens because of bad food choices, poor sleep habits, stress, stress can yeah. do it. Environmental toxins, we don't think of that often enough, but when you're exposed to environmental toxins, that happens. And then growth of cells, just as they grow and turn over, they can start creating bad copies. What was that movie with Michael Keaton? Multiplicity. Oh, uh, multiplicity. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're gonna go eat a dolphin. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Every single copy gets a little bit worse, <laughs> and so rapid growth can lead to cells that actually don't behave well, which ultimately leads to inflammation. Now, I bring all of this up because understanding the biologic process of all of this gives you tremendous control in both the mental aspect mm -hmm. and the physical aspect. So when I've talked to patients about fasting, it's 
really fascinating because they'll be like, oh, especially inpatient. Inpatient's mm-hmm. the funniest because they're like, well, you need to feed my mom, my wife, my whatever, because she hasn't eaten in eight hours. And I will turn around and be like, I'm going to make sure she doesn't eat for at least another eight more hours. Yeah, sure. Because we're going to turn on some different pathways right. that are going to help your significant other, mom, child, whatever, friend, heal better. It's fascinating that the hospital keeps shoving food at people all the time. It drives me nuts. Yeah, it's an antiquated process. It's, it's wrong. It's like the food pyramid. The food pyramid, as we learned back in the 80s, uh, which was developed when in the 40s and 50s. Yeah. It's, it's it's antiquated and it's not well researched. I mean, I don't. I, I go to the cardiac ward. And oh my goodness! They they're, they're post heart attack, and the first thing they give them is a package of graham. You can have graham crackers whenever you want. So nurses, bless their heart, they're they're helping patients by saying, "Oh, you know, would you like a little something to eat? Here's a little snack for you. Here's a little snack, and you're going to learn why in a little bit why snacking all the time, and then of course the types of food you have, which are highly processed foods." All these things lead to this. So the, I want to get sciencey now, and this is where I could go down a rabbit hole, so just cut me off if I'm getting too much. No, that's good. All right, so basically the reason why I'm a little bit passionate about like my the hospital patients being fed like this is because people aren't talking about the pathways that get turned on when you are fasting. So there's a couple pathways that are really important. There's two that are responsible during the fasting phase. And then there's actually two that happens when you eat and understanding the balance of the two Mm -hmm. is key. Okay. All right. So the first thing that happens is you can turn on something called the the sirtuin pathway, the cert pathway. So what is the cert pathway? The cert pathway is the silent information regulators. This is so cool. It's, um, Fantastic. Adele made it popular because she went on the CERT diet, which is supposed to turn on the CERT pathway. But all it is is the CERT pathway are longevity genes. You walk around with longevity genes waiting to be turned on. What they do is they promote longevity by actually fixing the DNA damage when methylation takes place. We talked about that in the last episode. We did. I'm glad that's not the shoulder that you hurt because I'm going to end up poking. Thank you for not <laughs> leaning over to poke the right shoulder. Um, yeah, so fixing DNA damage and protecting telomeres, which are at the caps of the chromosomes. And what they do also, in addition to fixing DNA, think of it like uh, if you're old enough to ever use a CD and you'd get a scratch on your CD, you could actually get a CD cleaner that uh-huh. would just kind of fix it. Uh-huh. That's what the sirtuin pathway does. In addition to that, it gets rid of old and dying cells known as autophagy. They improve mitochondrial function. So when you turn on the sirtuin pathway, the powerhouse of the cell that makes the cell work kicks on. They stimulate stem cells. Oh, nice. Yeah. So as you're healing right. from this surgery, right. when everybody says you need to eat for calories and calories, you know, you need to do this. Actually, no, you really should take, you should take advantage of the um, fasting windows to turn this whole process Agreed. on. And it decreases inflammation through the NRF2 pathway. So ultimately, the sirtuin pathway, these genes get turned on and they promote health span. Here's the sad part. Okay. The sirtuin pathway decreases as we age. It actually needs a cofactor called NAD, which is nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. It needs this to make the sirtuin factor work. So, sadly, if you don't have any NAD, you can fast for 30 days and not get the benefit of it. One of the reasons why we have nicotinamide riboside, true niogen, Mm -hmm. on the website is because if you're going to practice anti-aging, you go to uh, kbmdhealth.com to go ahead and look at that. We're going to do a video on this. We're going to have a whole episode on supplements at some point. But that's why NAD, that, that's why I have nicotinamide riboside there. That's a cofactor that gets turned into NAD. And NMN, um, nicotinamide mononucleotide anyway, he's one of those. <laughs> <laughs> that's another one that's currently like brand new to the game. And uh, people like David Sinclair are doing research on that to see if that's an easier way to produce more NAD. But keep that in mind. So as we age, you lose NAD. And as we age, you lose the sirtuin pathway. So to recap, uh, it's a longevity gene. The sirtuin genes are longevity genes. It repairs cells, decreases inflammation, and protects our chromosomes. 
naturally decreases as we age. So as you do this, you want to make sure that you keep your sirtuin pathway available by using uh, different products to keep your NAD up. Okay. Now, the other thing that happens when we fast is another pathway called the AMPK pathway. That's known as the activated protein kinase pathway. This gets turned on when there's no cellular energy. Okay. So when there's no ATP in the cell, the AMPK pathway goes up. This is awesome because this is really important in lipid metabolism, glucose control, and same thing over and over, it causes mitophagy and autophagy. It tells old, sick mitochondria to go away. Yeah. It tells old, sick cells to go away. When you have the cert, uh, the sirtuin pathway up and the AMPK pathway up, AMPK goes, don't bother trying to help that mitochondria. He's done. And they, they work in conjunction. So those two work on cellular repair. So when you fast, both of those go up. Am I making sense? It's making sense to me. Um, uh, yeah, basically, you're talking about we have all of these different cofactors and activities that go into action simply because of these fasting windows. I mean, in, in summation, without going through every single one. Yes. All right, so now that's fasting. So what happens when we eat? Well, when we eat, we grow. Right. So if you think of it from an evolutionary standpoint, when, when we evolved, we went through periods of fasting and feasting. And when you feast, that's when you that's when your cells go, we have fuel here, let's regenerate, let's do all this stuff. Mm -hmm. The most important pathway in that is known as the mTOR pathway, uh, also called the mammalian or mechanistic, I've seen it in two different ways, target of rapamycin pathway. That's really fancy, you call it mTOR. Bottom line is it gets turned on when there's protein and amino acids. Okay. Primarily proteins and amino acids. Also, another pathway gets turned on called the IGF-1 pathway, which is the insulin growth factor one pathway, insulin-like growth factor. Mm -hmm. These are both potent stimulus of growth and cell turnover. That is awesome if you're a bodybuilder because you want your mTOR up all the time because you're continually putting on muscle. That's bad if it's on all the time because as cells are growing, they're turning over and it turns into multiplicity where certain cells have a little skip in their hitch or whatever it's called, a DNA methylation, something happens and it's not right. Right. It goes unchecked. Yeah. And it just continues to grow. And then when that one goes unchecked and you continue to eat on a constant level, then that cell with the DNA mismatch produces two of it. Right. And then four of it exponential. Oh, that's cancer. Yep. That's what causes cancer. Definitely. So when you have your mTOR up and your IGF-1 up, that's one of the ways that not only do we age and create inflammation, but we can act, actually develop cancer that way. So when we fast, the sirtuin pathway goes up, the AMPK pathway goes up. When we eat, the sirtuin pathway goes down and the AMPK goes down, but the mTOR and the IGF-1 goes up. Mm -hmm. So for somebody like me and you, for somebody like you that has surgery, mm -hmm. you need to have cellular repair, but you also need your mTOR up. Yeah. So it becomes this balance of, okay, I need to, I need to use the mTOR to grow. I like to work out. I want to maintain muscle mass, so I need my mTOR up. But I also need to clear cellular damage. So various times I need to have the sirtuin pathway and the AMPK pathway up, which is why intermittent fasting is probably one of the best ways to do this. I think so. It. And, and uh, before we get too far, intermittent fasting is something that you and I just kind of have fallen into over the last several years, right? And I would say that some of that was just made easier because of our schedule. Getting up early, seeing patients all morning, and just simply not eating lunch until we would finish a full day. And at that point, I think that as that became more routine, not only was it easier to eat during that window, but I think that my food selection actually got better because I wanted to make my meal time count. I thought yeah, right? more about it. Yeah. Cause you actually look forward to that window and you go, okay, I'm yeah. going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to make sure. Um, I did Melanie Avalon's podcast several times. Oh, Melanie okay. Avalon has a great podcast called the intermittent fasting podcast. So if you want, you can check that out and she covers all aspects of this. But so let me just kind of sum up a, body of evidence that's uh that's really big and 
talk about fasting and we're gonna talk about intermittent fasting here. All right, there's a lot of science on this and a lot of data. And one of the people that's most often quoted is Dr. Sachin Panda, huh? who's uh, been on Rhonda Patrick's podcast and I think he's done all the rounds with all the people. Uh, what He's the first person that really started looking at a mouse model for this. And if there's one quote that you can take home from this, it's when you eat is as important as to what you eat. I agree with that. And he showed this in animal models. So Sachin Panda um, started all this. His study showed that when mice ate a high fat, high sugar diet, whenever they got hungry and wanted to, uh, and wanted to eat, they gained a lot of weight, their health declined, they developed the usual metabolic syndromes that, you know, affect so many Americans, diabetes, hypertension, hypertrichosideremia, and so on. Mm -hmm. But he took those, he took a different group of mice and he restricted when they could eat the high fat, high sugar diet to an eight hour window. And in that eight hour window, the mice ate the same, we're going to call it shitty diet. Mm -hmm. And they ate the same amount of calories. Mm -hmm. Yet, those that ate in the window lost weight, they improved their metabolic parameters, and they lived longer. Sure. So they overall had better health with the same amount of calories, just in a different time frame. So if you were to think about that, at least in a mouse model, that's pretty impressive. And one of the things that he talked about, he's discussed why it was an eight-hour window, and it actually was... Um, fortuitous the graduate student that was doing it uh, was working really long hours and his significant other said you you can't work 24 7 you have to cut it off at some point yeah so arbitrarily it was like eight hours because you know he had he wanted so he was working 16 hours sure. and then because he had to monitor the mice really carefully and do all this stuff and then he would go home for eight hours and so that how it that's how it became okay. but it worked out perfectly and it's interesting because the Sachin jokes about it like it was because of the significant other. But the reality is, is it falls into a circadian rhythm. And the circadian rhythm of the sleep-wake cycle, all our cells, actually 80% of our genes are associated on, the, on a circadian rhythm. Right. So what it turns out is that eight-hour window is, uh, falls into that circadian clock which we've talked about this before, but like night shift workers tend to have more health issues. Oh, definitely. Because they mess up their circadian clock. So it's, it, it's one of those funny things where you're like, you know, did, did he really stumble on it or did it just happen that that's when his body said it's time to go to bed? Yeah. No, it's a, uh, it's a really good point. And shut it down. And it's kind of interesting that um, kind of in, in a loose way, you're describing that, these mice that ate in that particular window, having the exact same diet, essentially, like what they ate. But the when they ate made the biggest difference, and it's uh, it's kind of nature's efficiency model. And I, and I kind of liken it to this. If you have a vehicle that has a large gas tank and you want it to drive a long distance, then it would make sense to fill up the gas tank and then drive there. It would be far less efficient to have a really, really small gas tank that would only get you to like the next town if you were driving four hours, for instance, because that's going to take time. You're going to have to pull off. You're going to have to fill up. And the efficiency model of the vehicle is lost. So it's, it's, it's just a mechanical analogy to say that the body is meant to basically have this reserve, but it wants to use the reserve, not just have the ability to store energy. It wants to be able to dig back in, in, the, in into the energy, kind of like your freezer yeah, exactly. refrigerator model. Yeah, exactly. The freezer refrigerator model, it would be like, if a, in the same analogy, if a, if you didn't drive very far mm -hmm. and you had a, a, a car with four gas tanks, mm -hmm. you, the one that doesn't get used oh, yeah. starts having, it becomes corroded and all this other yeah, stuff. Yeah, now, and now you're spending energy loading and pushing that around. Yes. I mean, it's like carrying around a the quote unquote spare tire. That's spare. exactly it. Yeah. yeah. And not only that, but there's cellular damage going on sure. and then, you know, yeah, it totally fits. Um, one of the things also, because in the circadian, we, we talk about the circadian rhythm, but one of the things that is on a circadian rhythm is the digestive tract. Mm -hmm. So something a lot of people don't really realize is, is that when you eat, you on a cellular level, you actually have to break down this food, right? right, right. So you have to break it down and do it. Well, 
it's actually an inflammatory process. It creates a little bit of inflammation. And we have seen that when you eat a large meal or even any food at all, it just depends on the level, Mm -hmm. you will increase inflammatory markers like interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha. So when you continually eat, remember getting back to the analogy of giving graham crackers to the patient that's sitting in bed, mindlessly chomping away, looking at something, or you're sitting on your couch, doing a complete Netflix binge. You want me to open that for you? Oh, yes, he's opening. We're opening a Waterloo here for Eric because he's one-handed. Yeah, and I'm not just drinking Waterloo because of my shoulder, just in case any of y'all from Waterloo are looking. (laughs) He loves Waterloo. It's good stuff. (laughs) Um, So if, if you stop and think about it, if you're continually, like, snacking, you're continually creating a little bit of inflammation, and you're throwing your intestinal tract circadian rhythm off. Definitely. No, that may, well, I don't want to get into it yet. I've got a thought, but uh, keep going because uh, there's, there's some more in play with uh, some of the other things that we've talked about that lead to inefficiency. So yeah. Keep going. So from a eating standpoint, if you're eating, you're throwing off the circadian rhythm of the gut, you're increasing inflammatory markers. And, oh, remember, we've got mTOR and IGF-1 going on, going, let's do it. We're growing. More cellular turnover. But the inflammation (laughs) is creating more of the damage in the new cells. Definitely. It's basically aging these new cells quicker. It's the opposite of cellular repair. mTOR, IGF-1, no cellular repair growth. Mm -hmm. Sirtuin and APMK or AMPK. But if you're always snacking, you never get that AMPK or the sirtuin up. You're just am torn it. I'm yeah. am torn it. Yeah. And I remember years ago, I gave a lecture at Dan, uh, Dr. Dan Pompa's conference. Oh, in, in San Diego? In San Diego. That's where yeah. it was. In San Diego. And I, uh, he, he had a great example of twin bodybuilders that do intermittent fasting. Uh-huh. And he was discussing there. He's like, they're going to die sooner because their mTOR is up, but they're but they're figuring out how to live longer as bodybuilders because they're also fasting. So it's that ratio of mTOR to fasting. Yeah. Anyways, it was, a, it was an interesting slide where he talked about because, anyways, because bodybuilding is risky at that point. So anyways, you were going to say something. No, I, mean, I don't know that I was, but I'll say something anyway. So um, cells need to rest also. And if somebody needed to work around, like, let's take the, the nighttime worker, like you mentioned earlier, they, they typically just have difficulty sleeping during the day. The nine months that I was dedicated to working at night, I think I aged five years. I mean, I, I could not stand doing that and working the hospital, a dedicated night shift that, that wore me out. But at the same time, I, I just couldn't sleep during the day. Well, for the same reason that eating all of the time and keeping uh, some of the active eating pathways up and elevated, it never allowed my body to sleep and rest and clean. So it's the same thing as cellular health. So if you know that you need to get between seven and nine hours of sleep daily, this is really the, the sleep time that your cells need for the same reason, is that there's, there's work that needs to be done. And if there's food present, then it's taking it away Good point. From, from the cleaning and the work and things like that that need to be done for the same reason that we need to, to sleep every day. Good point. Yeah. Like you, if you're going to clean the building, you, you have to do it when everybody's out. I feel really proud that I came up with that because I don't feel like I got a lot of sleep last night. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that one, I probably could have crafted it better if I'd gotten some sleep. <laughs> no, anyway. You did great. That makes total sense. Um, so this, so that's there. And then looking at this, an article um, in in coordination with Dr. Uh, Panda's lab, who's this? Look at these. Uh, yeah, so he's listed as like the fourth author. But this is a an article published in the Endocrine Reviews uh, looked at human data on this. And it was time-restricted eating for the prevention and management of metabolic diseases in wow. the Journal of Endocrinology Reviews. Everything that we're talking about is true, and it makes total sense because they're showing it in humans. Essentially, autophagy happens when we sleep, and fasting of any kind augments this. When we eat, it takes three to five hours on a cellular level to be done with that food. So, here's the... the when, when I talk to people, when I talk to my patients about fasting, this is where it's, it's kind of a... A, a little difficult because your fast doesn't begin until at least three hours after the last calorie taken in. 
So when people go, oh, I'm intermittent fasting, I had my last meal at mm. whatever, 9 p.m., mm. and then I didn't eat until 16 hours after that or whatever. No, you really didn't, on a cellular level, you didn't start the fast until midnight, even though the last food that you had. So it's not so much about um, fasting. Think of it as fed or unfed state, mm -hmm. which is kind of new to me in the sense because I would play that game with myself. I would play, oh, I didn't eat there. I can eat at this time. You know, and, and there's that also brings into question like qualifying foods or nutrition as to what still counts as technically fasting and not. There are those, I think it was Longo, Vulture Longo, who said that coffee – Consuming coffee is still technically considered fasting. Is that right? Was he the one who said that? Yeah, Jason Fung, big, Fung a, a big fasting expert. Walter Longo also. Um, you've got some purists that say that any type of xenobiotics or anything that your body has to digest will break a fast. But according to these experts, as long as you're not having any calories or bumping the glucose, you're still in a fasted state. So much so that some people actually advocate for a fat fasted state. Won't get into that. That's a whole separate debate. Yeah, 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 but yeah. essentially what you're saying is I'm going to, I'm going to remain in ketosis. Yeah. That, yeah. That's, that's a more uh, ketotic thing. And you yeah. have experimented with that in the past too, but it's interesting because you, the perception on the early end is that intermittent fasting is not achievable for me because uh, fill in the blank, but one of them may be, I still want my coffee, but I want my meals for later in the day. As someone who has adopted that exact model, I still drink coffee in the morning with a little bit of, of a non-sweetened but fattened creamer. Um, I think that I've realized the benefits of doing intermittent fasting for a lot of the same things that we're talking about today. Yeah, and in this particular article, uh, they he proved exactly what it was in humans. They showed that a seven or eight hour eating window seems to get all the benefits of the fast. What are those benefits again? I'm being redundant, but I'm gonna say it over and over. Sirtuin pathway goes up, the AMPK pathway goes up, mTOR goes down, IGF-1 goes down. So you can get that window. Here's a really cool fact uh, that as I'm doing this research that I started thinking about, because you know my... My massively transformative goal is to cure dementia. Correct. Someday. I just keep saying that because one day I really feel like i that's what drives me to protect our brains. When you're asleep, the glymphatic system, which is the lymph system of the brain, mm -hmm. kicks in. And if you're in a fasted state, autophagy on the microglial cells, which are the immune cells in the brain... Uh, it starts to clear the brain with all this debris, and then if you have proper sleep, all the cells are cleared out, but they have to get out of the brain. Because remember, the blood-brain barrier is that semi-permeable thing. So it's, uh, there's some evidence to show that in a fast, when you routinely fast, you clear your brain, protect yourself from dementia. So. And just a follow-up question on that. So I, I had not heard that before. Um, so you're saying the lymphatic system is more efficient effectively if there is a routine fasting, correct? Correct. So is that also to say that it might be better to do your window of eating in this theory in the morning so that you're fasting by the time that you go to sleep? Ooh, that's a great question. And we're going to get to that okay. shortly. Right. Two seconds. All right. So if, if, you're, if you're looking at this, from me, I'm thinking, okay, the physiologic science makes sense. We've got animal data that makes sense. And now we've got human data that correlates with the animal data that's there. So this is really, really, really cool. And at this point, you're like, whatever. You're so geeky. You keep talking. Just, all right, I'm in. <laughs> I want to go ahead and do this. So how do I do this? How do I intermittent fast? All right. So if you're interested in this, um, let's begin by doing one thing. I'm a person of extreme. And what? I don't do stuff like this, so I'm going to recommend that uh, people do this. Um, the, it says two guys that have done several five-day fasts in different <laughs> ways. And <laughs> <laughs> Eric's, Eric's first five-day fast, he did a full water fast, just jumped in like a uh, day before. There are better ways to do there, it. There are better ways to. <laughs> basically, I'm saying ease into everything, all right? <laughs> yeah. All right, so one way to do this that I've been reading about is that as you start your fast, you can push that first meal out. Uh -huh. further. And the reason why I say that when you said to do it in the morning, uh -huh. uh, it appears that for sure do not break your fast at least an hour after you wake up. And this falls into that circadian rhythm type stuff. Uh -huh. So if you go for a week, push that first meal out for an hour. 
Next week, push it out to two hours. Next week, three hours. Keep trying to push it. And the reason why is you train your body to adjust on a hormonal level. Definitely. The leptin will start decreasing. Leptin, or I'm sorry, the leptin starts going up. Your ghrelin Ghrelin, starts decreasing. Ghrelin is the hormone that makes you really hungry. Leptin is the one that tells you that you're full. Those start adjusting, and this allows that to happen. And you train your liver to start with the glyco the glycogenolysis. You you go, hey buddy, we need a if, if we need fuel, we don't need to eat it. You can start training that. And so um, I that's I think it makes total sense to ease into something like this. If you've ever tried to do it and you go, it didn't work, I felt shaky and all this stuff, and we'll talk about that in a second. A really interesting thing that I was unaware of also, when people go into the weekend, uh-huh. And they're like, oh, it's the weekend. It's the freaking weekend, man. Have me some fun. <laughs> so they end up um, getting off their fasting schedule and really kind of throw it uh, in. They just eat what they want. Well, as it turns out, you break that circadian cycle, uh-huh. and it can take several days for your body to have that sirtuin AMPK uh, reaction to it. So when you train your body, this, the sirtuin and AMPK is like, all right, we're ready to go. Hey, are you ready? It's two. It's time for us to really, you know, go. And then all of a sudden, uh, the weekend happens and Saturday is like, what are we doing eating Egg McMuffins on Saturday morning at 8 a.m.? And I've been known to do this also. Homemade so, Egg McMuffins. Homemade Egg McMuffins, yes. Um, yeah, we do. Yeah. So anyways, I, I thought that was interesting. And they equate it to essentially jet lag. Oh. You're moving, so. you're moving your gut circadian rhythm. You're moving your cellular sure. circadian rhythm. So it's like traveling to a different time zone. When people travel to different time zones, they have trouble sleeping, they have trouble, they may be hungry at odd times, and so on. So, um, quick note, because we'll eventually do a whole thing on the microbiome, but as it turns out, time-restricted eating is also good for your microbiome, which is on its own circadian rhythm as well. Sure. And it improves microbial diversity by fasting. Um, One thing, I'm seeing lots of commercials Uh on this and it with our GIA Alliance research division, there's lots of drugs trying to come out for something called NAFLD, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So 30 years ago, NAFLD didn't really, it was very rare. Uh And now you see a sonogram and it's like normal to To say, you know, uh, changes of fatty deposition in the liver. Like uh-huh. almost normal. Like it's not even considered like a pathology anymore. Yeah. Which shows how common it is. Well, as it turns out, we're seeing that so much. And when you intermittent fast, you the reason why that fat's there is because you've got the refrigerator freezer thing. Mm-hmm. Your liver's holding on to all this glycogen, waiting to use it, but it never gets used. So eventually the liver goes, well, mm-hmm. screw it. Let's put it in the freezer. In other words, let's convert the glycogen to fat. And then the fat starts sitting in the liver and it becomes foie gras. You know, have you ever had foie gras? <laughs> no, I haven't, but <laughs> I, it doesn't sound very attractive when you describe it like that. Foie gras is goose liver. And what they do, it's, it's a horrible thing, but they force feed geese to the point where they just feed them all the time. They never let their sirtuin AMPK pathway goes up yeah. and they deposit fat in the liver and then it becomes a delicacy at really expensive restaurants. Yeah. I'll admit it's pretty good. And then... Uh, you basically, we're turning ourselves into foie gras and, um, by doing this. So that's a whole separate discussion. But I find it fascinating that there's so many freaking commercials on drugs to do. And there's uh, so many research studies on how to treat non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and how to do this. And there's not one that says, hey, it's free. Don't eat. Well, that's exactly why they don't say it. Because they would like the money. Frustrating. Very. So, Hey, just a, a sidetrack here. Um, and if, if this is too early and you're going to get to it, then then stop me. But you're a GI doc, and a little over 80% of all serotonin is used and produced in the uh, in the bowels, correct? So correct. that in part plays with uh, efficient peristaltic motion, pushing the food through and making certain that our GI system circadian rhythm, as you've referenced, is operating optimally. Whenever we have high stress, like it doesn't really matter. Um, It could be, you know, stress from work, stress from relationships or stress from eating at the wrong points in time. Whenever we have high stress, cortisol circulates. When cortisol is circulating, the neurotransmitter um, production 
such as catecholamines like serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine is hampered. It's not as efficient as it is otherwise. Would it make sense that in part why it's so important for our gut circadian rhythm to stay where it is is because our gut is dependent upon adequate amounts of serotonin and we might actually be interrupting our body's ability to produce the exact neurotransmitters that make it a much easier transition to move food through efficiently through the GI tract. That makes total sense to me when I hear that. And now you're going to make me look up to see if any, if anybody's looked at this from a irritable bowel slash inflammatory bowel disease pathway. Yeah. Uh, as we sit there and tell everybody to go on a FODMAT diet or do this diet or do that diet or do the, um, why not just go on a circadian eating diet? So you actually went right where I was going to go with that. Uh, and that is if you happen to have a digestive issue and certainly if it's a new development, might it not be induced by simply never giving your gut the time to rest and break. So it has a stress response. And now we're just simply not producing the right neurotransmitters, specifically serotonin in the gut in order to address the correct motion through the small and uh, the small bowel and large intestine. That makes great sense. If we could ever get, well, we, we can, the, Ability exists, but not in my particular clinic where we can just go to Quest. Sure. But checking serotonin levels uh-huh. in in the body during various fasted states, that's interesting. When you do fast, your norepinephrine goes up. Correct. So I mean, think of it as production, right? It's production. You're exactly right. So if the norepinephrine goes up, I did not find any references to serotonin, but that makes total sense. If we look at drugs to increase motility, they're usually some sort of 5-HT receptor agonist to Definitely. do that, which is a serotonin a uh, receptor that does that. Well, hmm. and the catecholamine cascade of assembling those, you know, from dopamine to serotonin to norepinephrine, they're basically all coming from the same uh, analog, right? Because there's, you need dopamine in order to produce enough serotonin. You need enough serotonin in order to produce enough melatonin. So rest disturbances and things like that could also be affected if we're not basically adhering to a good time to eat. Yeah. The, probably the best things you can do for your health baseline foundation is get on a great sleep schedule and get on a great eating schedule. Eating schedule. Eating schedule. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. And oh, here's something that's really cool. Also, a little life pro tip. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I follow a Reddit forum called Life Pro Tips, and sometimes they're like, I'm like, oh, it's pretty good. Yeah. Tennis shoes. That. Yeah. <laughs> um, life. Uh, we've heard two life pro tips. If you do happen to have a partial tear of your supraspinatus and you choose to work out for the next two or three years, don't, uh, don't do that. Don't life do pro tip. It's Just go in and see a doctor soon. <laughs> um, this is really interesting because something that I had not come across. Apparently, after 60 days of fasting or doing intermittent fasting, you start training your body and it does shift to uh, utilize fat quicker as fuel than it did before that. So a full two months of intermittent fasting and you start to, your body learns how to burn fat and it's from a enzyme called hepatic lipase, which I was Uh, unfamiliar with, hepatic lipase. And what that does is that's the enzyme that specifically gets sent out to break down fat. Yeah. Yeah. Not the enzyme to help you digest the fat that you eat. That is pancreatic lipase. Hepatic lipase, after you've trained it, can actually uh, help break down fat. So the longer you're on it, probably the better. That's it. That actually makes a lot of sense. Though. Yeah. If you could, basically, you could modulate your body's fat content, like the, the constitution of the fat in your body, by helping your liver do that. Is that, would that make sense? Yeah, because you're if not you're not stressing it out from overfeeding yourself, you're not foie gras yourself. <laughs> you're not foie gras yourself. I like that. <laughs> then, then you have this ability. You're like, I'm not a fat ass goose. I can, I can make this happen. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Next time we're like uh, out somewhere and you get like really hungry and you see like a buffet, you go, you, you want to foie gras ourselves? I'm like, yeah, let's roll up in that buffet. Yeah. <laughs> um, quick little trick uh, another little life pro tip uh, a lot of times people don't realize that when you start to fast like this 
you'll actually have some diuresis, especially if the only, uh, you're not trying to take in calories, but you could be taking in coffee, which is a mild diuretic. You could be taking other things. Uh, you actually have some volume shifts, which will give people headaches and the feeling of lightheadedness. Mm -hmm. And then they'll run and eat a donut saying, oh, I'm hypoglycemic. It's actually not. A little trick is that you can actually put a little salt in water and you can increase your volume uh, that way so you can absorb the electrolytes yeah. you you quit the, you quit the diuresis and your volume goes up just a little if if you go oh i tried fasting once and i got a headache well try this first add a little salt to some water all right so we know that fasting is good can we all agree that fasting is good and we've covered a little bit of the intermittent fasting other forms of fasting are also good like the five-day fast the fasting mimicking diet there's all these fasts but they all do slightly different things this one is more of the long play this okay. is the lifestyle change definitely, type thing definitely uh, so you've already, you understand why it's good for you. You understand that eating is an inflammatory process and you understand that it has to all be on a, a certain circadian rhythm. All right. So here's the basics. And in case, um, this is, if you just, this is pretty much how to do it if you don't want to know why. So, all right, start to extend the fast basically an hour a week so that your body starts to adapt. Do not ingest food for at least one hour post waking. Okay, no Post food, so that wake comes up down, seven, don't eat, yeah, at least after eight. That comes down to your question of the glymphatic system. Mm -hmm. Really, it's more important that the glymphatic system has that tail end going forward. Oh, okay. So, yeah. so it's basically a wake and clean kind of thing. It's Yeah, it's happening, uh -huh. but as, it, as you are going through whatever process it is, we do know that sleep-related fasting is especially important due to the circadian rhythm of the body. Okay. So what you want to do is extend that fast. So when you're, if you can imagine it, when you're fasting, as your sirtuin and AMPK go up, mm -hmm. So you have to mobilize all the fuel, mobilize all the fuel, and it's slowly going up. mTOR is going down. IGF-1 is going down. And then when this is up, uh -huh. the glymphatic system is removing things as it's doing that while you're sleeping. But you need that sirtuin and AMPK to get to cause the autophagy and the mitophagy to get the biggest benefit of it. So um, the, you know, sleep-related fasting is super important. Do not have any sugar three hours before bedtime. And this one, because the second you do that, you're going to break your fast. So no sugar three hours before bedtime. And the, that's a sad one because a lot of people like to have a glass of wine before they go to bed. That will break the fast. And then you're starting over. So whenever you have that glass of wine, that's going to have some sugar in it. And that will definitely break it. You referenced her earlier, but Melanie Avalon didn't, because you went on her show at least twice. Yeah, two maybe, or three times. Maybe three times. One of those episodes, if I remember correctly, and I believe it was her, she was talking about if you are, happen to be somebody who still retains somewhat of a sweet tooth, but you want to be an intermittent faster, it's better if you have the eight-hour window to have that, uh, that consumption of your sugar at the beginning as you move into breaking your fast because you're getting it all over with at once. Is that something that she said? Yeah, that is something. And she's also uh, kind of a, a wine fan. Why is she a wine fan? Because... Um, there's some data to show that wine, resveratrol, has been shown to increase the sirtuin pathway. Mm -hmm. We've also seen one of the, oh, we got a sponsor, don't we? We forgot to do our sponsor. Uh, Atrantil is a polyphenol blend, which has also been shown to increase the sirtuin pathway, which we'll get into in a different episode. But if you want to check out Atrantil, go to lovemytummy.com. Forward slash KBMD. Lovemytummy.com forward slash KBMD. There you'll see a discount code and that will help you increase your sirtuin levels. It's actually known as a fasting mimetic combination of polyphenols that actually do that. So uh, lovemytummy.com forward slash KBMD. Look at that. Uh, so don't have any sugar three hours before bedtime and try to make the target eating window eight hours. Mm -hmm. Don't let it slide around on the weekend because that'll disrupt the circadian rhythm like jet, jet lag. And then finally, if you're fasting and it's going great and you, you had dinner at 6 p.m. and then somehow, you, I mean, like Carla, Carla every once in a while will get on a baking phase and you can't not take your daughter's lemon bar you and should. try it. You know, you need to, you, you have she to, she like, made it, she made it. You so better you, eat it. Yeah. You better eat it. So I've had that happen to me sometimes where I'm like, <laughs> I'm in my fasting window already. And she'd be like, I made these lemon bars or I made these cupcakes or whatever. And I'm like, okay, That's exactly what I wanted. And it's delicious. <laughs> but, um, whenever I do that, 
I can hack it a little bit. Okay. And one way to do it is if you if you take in some glucose and break that, uh -huh. then go for a brisk walk immediately. Okay. And what that does is that increases the GLUT4 receptors in the large muscles, uh -huh. mobilizes the glucose that's getting in there, and gets it out of your system and disposes of it quicker than if you just sat there on the couch and watched you know, Netflix and chilled. Yeah. Uh, you can also ingest something acidic. So lemon juice, lime juice, apple cider vinegar. That's one of the reasons why they think apple cider vinegar works for glucose control. By doing that, uh, you actually, it modulates the... Um, the absorption of glucose in some way that I'm a little unfamiliar with, but people do talk about that. Um, I also would hack it by taking in something that um, like metformin that we talked about last time or metformin plus growth hormone plus DHEA is a longevity process. Mm -hmm. The belief is the metformin turns on the AMPK pathway. Correct. As it turns out, they believe that berberine can do something similar. I personally question a little of the berberine, the berberine data because we know the absorption of polyphenols. Right. And that's where I'm like, hmm. So berberine has been shown in one to two grams to actually help with glucose control. But how's it getting there? How's it getting there? Yeah. Yeah. And so anyways, that's something to think about. So a little berberine. And it ultimately... When we're talking about supplements and looking at stuff like this, the reason why we have these, these are all available on kbmdhealth.com. Our sponsor, Atrantil, lovemytummy.com forward slash kbmd. Uh, we just came out with Atrantil Pro. You can talk to your functional medicine doctor about that, but we've added some spore-based biotics to it. We know that CBD decreases inflammation, which is one of the reasons why we have that there. We know that nicotinamide riboside actually increases NAD, and we have broccoli, which has been known to increase the NRF2 pathway. So there's some rhyme and reason as to why we have different things, and they're all based around decreasing inflammation and increasing longevity. That is the episode 76 fasting podcast. So a couple of follow-ups. Uh, one, we made reference uh, several months ago to the frontline critical care, COVID critical care oh, yeah. uh, alliance. And I had a, a close friend I told that we were going to uh, do this particular episode specifically on fasting, intermittent fasting. And she sent a snippet from FLCCC where they actually said in terms of cellular repair, um, intermittent fasting for those who are suffering from COVID or even long COVID is a wise choice to allow your body to help clean itself because it's believed that during cellular repair, which you referenced today would help eliminate some of the expressions of spike protein. Ooh, and that's that makes on, sense. that's on, it's on their, uh, on their website. They make, I mean, it's a direct, um, indication of why they believe intermittent fasting would be a help. Uh, the second thing I wanted to bring up is I am, I'm trying to remember who told us this, but we're talking about the eight hour window to eat. In actuality, I think that if you could even narrow your window even more daily and still be an intermittent faster, I'm trying to remember who said this, but let's say you take your eight-hour window to four. It's, you probably will get some exponential benefit from really narrowing the window and still eating the same caloric intake. So you don't just have to stop by having one-third of your day as your, as your eating window. You could whittle it down to four and eat between... 2 p.m. and 6 p.m. or whatever it happens to be. What are your thoughts on that? Interesting you bring that up. So that's the Peter Atia thought, uh -huh. where he just eats the one meal a day. Uh -huh. And it, it's, it falls in a short period. An actual study uh, followed some people that did the four-hour window, mm -hmm. and they actually gained weight. But then in retrospect, they looked at it, and it's probably because their total consumption was way more because they really felt compelled in those four hours oh, to, cram. to cram. So it has to be... It, and it's it was not sustainable for them. So okay. I um, I believe in it. And if you ask Peter Atia, he says, yeah, for sure. One meal, one good meal he's a day. He's really fit. He's super fit. Yeah. yeah. You know what's funny about him what's is that, that it, he's got, uh, um, if you Google fat Peter Atia, uh -huh. it's when he was competing in like a long distance swimming. Oh. He was carving it up all the time. Yeah. And he was actually a little chubby. But he was in fantastic cardio fit shape for that particular thing. And Isn't then, he the guy that swam from island to island in yeah, Hawaii or something? Just, yeah, he was like super into that. He's kind of an extreme guy. And yeah. so, you know, and uh, it, and then it, that's that's when he saw himself or something. I don't know. He, I saw him on a podcast and he was talking about that's why he went into full-on ketosis oh, for like okay. three years. Yeah. Straight up keto the whole time. 
and that's when he lost all his weight. And now he's learning that, oh, it's everything. You can do this and be there. But he, due to his schedule, it just works better for him to eat one really big meal. So the four-hour window probably works as long as you're not saying, well, it's only four hours. I'm going to overdo it. But that's that was in a human study. So you don't know what else is going on. You're sure. taking people's words for it. So because if you look at, oh, Sachin Panda has a website called My Circadian Clock. Yes, you can sign up. It's called I think it's called My Circadian Clock, where um, all you do is you sign up and it gives you an app and you just you you put in what you eat and when you eat and across the board, we as humans overestimate our fasting and we underestimate the foods that we are eating when you actually write it all down. Oh, I'm certainly guilty of that. There's no there's no there's no doubt. So if you were to just uh, randomly say what is your your eating window, I would say it's often 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. Like, that's work days. Because on the weekend, I don't do that. And, um, I mean, I get close, usually, unless we've got Dave Killer bread, uh, English muffins, and then I'm just <laughs> as guilty of getting up and making those uh, in, in the morning. And then now, learning today that's resetting things, then maybe I just need to move the consumption of the, the DKB muffins to... To the afternoon and just yeah. start at two, but you're right. I think there's several days that I would be two to six. I mean, I'm sorry, two to eight, not two to six. Two to eight it would be, but th- those are my ideal days. And there's some others like today. I, I think I ate at uh, twelve forty-five or whatever it is, and then I'll probably eat until seven. So it's not exact, but it's still close to the window but I, I could see that just happening. yeah if you think about it even if you fall off of it you're still trying to fall into that you're letting that circadian rhythm stay intact at least yeah sure you know and that being said it's family it's i love doing my little dave killer bread mcmuffin station that we do once every few months where i'm just putting those out for the whole family when we're all in town because it's rare like there's you know i mean life happens so Oh, those are really tasty. Yeah, they're really good. So um, that's all I got on intermittent fasting right here. Yeah. Hope it wasn't too sciencey and hope it makes sense. But hit us up. Uh, please contact us, ask questions, come up with different topics. The success of this show depends so much on all of y'all who listen uh, and take the time to spend it with us. We're very appreciative. Please, if you like this episode or any other episode, share it. You can text it to your friends. You can take any of these episodes, whether it happens to be on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, or just some other RSS feed and soon to be Rumble or Locals. You like it. It helps us stay going just by sharing and helps us get noticed. And for all of those who write in every week, thank you. Um, We read every single thing that someone sends in. And for the most part, they're nice sometimes. (laughs) I may may get a little static today from my little bit uh, mildly greasy hair and and uh, weird, uh, weird elbow yeah, we, holder. We may like get a bunch of angry emails from all those competitive eaters, like Joey Chestnut out there, where they're just like, "Fasting's for weenies, oh man!" My gosh, <laughs> uh, but he does eat a lot of weenies in a hot dog eating contest. So. Yes, he does. Anyway. Um, yeah. So anyways, please, if you uh, also giving a review helps us quite a bit as well and, and lets us know how to improve and move on. But go ahead and go to lovemytummy.com forward slash KBMD to take a look at Atron Teal, which is my baby. Super proud of it. And we're seeing all the health benefits of it. Every time we do an episode like this, we learn more about it. Definitely. Well, thank you all. That's going to be it for episode number 76. We will see you on the Gut Check Project for 77. Take care. All right, let's do a YouTube. All right, Paul, we're going to do a YouTube, what, 30 second? How should we do this? Should we just go, we just did an episode on fasting. Yeah. And then should we just I, say. What's wrong with Eric's shoulder? Whatever. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, here, you do this. We'll go. You know, we just did an episode on fasting. Eric just had sh- shoulder surgery two days ago, and, and he's here. What's your excuse? Yeah. yeah that sounds good. <laughs> All right, ready? Yeah, three, All right. two. Hey, welcome to the Get Check Project. This is a recap of episode 76, our fasting episode. This is my co-host, Eric Rieger, who just had shoulder surgery two days ago, showed up like a baller here to do the podcast. What's your excuse? Yeah, come on in. So if you want to learn a little bit about intermittent fasting or what you should do if you think that you're tearing a muscle in your rotator cuff, this is an episode for you. This is an episode. So tune in. A couple quick things. 30-second recap. If you want to start fasting, we've got tools on how to do it. If you want to know why you want to fast, we explain all that. And if you want to talk about the science about 
with humans, animals, how effective it is for you, you need to be doing this. Tune into the Gut Check Project. We'll see you there.